Greetings everyone, welcome to our channel. When the Hyperloop first sparked a frenzy in 2013, it was just an Elon Musk idea. Very exciting, maybe possible, definitely hard to believe. Now five years on, a version of the futuristic tube-based transportation system is taking shape in the Nevada desert. Some 35 miles north of Las Vegas, the terrain is all sand, rock, and spiky shrubbery, leading up to stunning reddish mountains on the horizon. It's a world just isolated enough for Virgin Hyperloop 1 to build a giant white tube and not attract too much attention, apart from the few local tortoises that the secluded engineers have adopted. Creating the first major new mode of transport in more than a century. In this video, we are going to tell you all about the real and original origins behind the Virgin Hyperloop 1. Without any further ado, let's get started. Reinventing Transport Imagine being able to travel from Dallas to Austin in 20 minutes or Dubai to Abu Dhabi in 12 minutes. Virgin Hyperloop 1 is reinventing transport. The new transport system will levitate magnetically, running in a partial vacuum to reach speeds of up to 670 miles per hour on land. Virgin Hyperloop 1 is to devise the technology blueprint on which the transport system operates. The systems engineering and enterprise architecture experts have been working on the plans for the complex software and traffic control systems that will be needed. The first Hyperloop, the tubular tizzy started in 2012 when Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk suggested the Hyperloop as a new form of transportation, one that would be twice as fast as a plane and totally solar powered. He didn't offer any engineering specifics at the time, but in August 2013 he produced a 57-page paper that outlined his technical thinking for how this system would work. At its core, Hyperloop is all about removing the two things that slow down regular vehicles, friction and air resistance. To do away with the former, you make the pod hover above its track like a magnetic levitation train. Musk originally suggested doing this with air bearings, little jets of air on the bottom of the pod. Think of air hockey, he said, but where the air comes out of the puck instead of the table. Today, most Hyperloop engineers have decided instead to rely on passive magnetic levitation. Where standard maglev systems are power-hungry and expensive, this system uses an array of permanent magnets on the vehicle. When those magnets move over conductive arrays in the track, they create a magnetic field that pushes the pod up, no current required. A complementary magnet system, think of two magnets pushing off one another, would give the pods a push every few miles or so. The near total lack of friction and air resistance means you don't need a constant propulsion system. As for air resistance, that's where the tube comes in. Yes, tubes also just feel like the future, but that's not the point. The tubes enclose the space through which the pods move, so you can use vacuums to hoover out nearly all the air, leaving so little that the physics are like being at an altitude of 200,000 feet. And so, like cruising on an airplane, a Hyperloop needs only a little bit of energy to maintain the pod's speed, because there's less stuff to push through. More speed with less power gets you to where you're going faster, greener, and depending on energy costs, maybe cheaper too. What happened next? Soon after Musk's paper hit the internet, a handful of companies sprung up, bringing together engineers and VC money to solve the problems for real. From the beginning, LA-based Virgin Hyperloop 1 has appeared to be the most serious contender, with serious VC backing, hundreds of employees, a full bank account, and a test track in the Nevada desert, where in December, it sent a pod racing to 240 miles per hour. Hyperloop Transportation Technologies takes a less built-up approach, Nearly all its engineers have day jobs at other companies, places like Boeing, NASA, and SpaceX. In their free time, they work together mostly online and in distinct groups to solve the engineering problems standing between humanity and Hyperloop. It has plans to build networks in Central Europe, South Korea, and India. Similarly, there's Rloop, a Reddit-based community of people who study the various engineering problems in the mission of decentralizing high technology. 2021 is the year, and it is here. The Hyperloop bears the Muskian hallmarks of a radical futurism, but its brilliance is in the fact that it won't take a revolution to build one. It's really just a collection of existing transportation and industrial technologies. It's a chimera, part elevated structure, metal tube, bullet train, pressure vessel, and vacuum system all squished together. The challenge is integrating them without smushing paying passengers or profit margins. Hyperloop One thinks it can launch a commercial system in 2021 which is why it's out here in the desert with its test tube, aka DevLoop. This is where the company is working out the myriad engineering challenges, trying to make a system it can deploy commercially. How does a Hyperloop tube work? The basic idea of Hyperloop, as envisioned by Musk, is that the passenger pods or capsules travel through a tube, 
either above or below ground. To reduce friction, most but not all of the air is removed from the tubes by pumps. Overcoming air resistance is one of the biggest uses of energy in high-speed travel. Airliners climb to high altitudes to travel through less dense air. In order to create a similar effect at ground level, Hyperloop encloses the capsules in a reduced pressure tube, effectively allowing the trains to travel at airplane speeds while still on the ground. In Musk's model, the pressure of the air inside the Hyperloop tube is about one-sixth the pressure of the atmosphere on Mars, a notable comparison as Mars is another of Musk's interests. This means an operating pressure of 100 pascals, which reduces the drag force of the air by 1,000 times relative to sea level conditions and would be equivalent to flying above 150,000 feet. How do Hyperloop capsules work? The Hyperloop capsules in Musk's model float above the tube surface on a set of 28 air-bearing skis, similar to the way that the puck floats just above the table on an air hockey game. One major difference is that it is the pod, not the track, that generates the air cushion in order to keep the tube as simple and cheap as possible. Other versions of Hyperloop use magnetic levitation rather than air skis to keep the passenger pods above the tracks. The pod would get its initial velocity from an external linear electric motor, which would accelerate it to high subsonic velocity and then give it a boost every 70 miles or so. In between, the pod would coast along in near vacuum. Each capsule could carry 28 passengers. Other versions aim to carry up to 40, plus some luggage, Another version of the pods could carry cargo and vehicles. Pods would depart every two minutes or every 30 seconds at peak usage. Key successes. Devise the technology blueprint for new transport system that's created for customers rather than infrastructure. Accelerated delivery of the software system requirements required for Hyperloop by 30%. Success, so far so good. Hyperloop One has completed some 200 test runs at varying speeds, collecting data on every variable it can track. In December, it went for pure speed, sending the pod to 240 miles per hour in just a few seconds, a new Hyperloop record. Expect to see a lot of those in the next few years. The first Hyperloop systems will likely target very specific use cases with built-in passengers and minimal political hurdles. They could connect an airport to a city center or public transit hub, or send cargo from a port to an inland distribution center so trucks don't have to crowd into already congested areas. Tackling a real long-distance, city-to-city route will make things much harder. To even have a shot at competing, Hyperloop must start by finding a way to finagle through the bureaucratic regulations that govern what gets built where. The people running these companies insist that it won't be as hard as it seems, and that they're already working with eager governments to get their systems built. To make things easier, Hyperloop One held a competition in which cities pitched for the right to host the thing. No doubt, places willing to clear out obstacles like pesky regulations stood out. The winners included Canada, with a route connecting Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal, Florida, Orlando to Miami, and India, Mumbai to Chennai. Bottom line. So, this is all about the origins of Virgin Hyperloop One, and already tests have been performed. In no time, we will see technological advancements in the form of Hyperloop One around the globe. Are you going to travel in this? What are your thoughts about this idea? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also, hit the bell icon button so that you'll get a notification whenever we post a new video.